A prophet speaks out of the horizon of hope. Now, that's not just a simple word or a, a simple cliche. You know, what is hope? Well, first of all, you distinguish hope from two things that it's normally confused with. One is wishful thinking and the other is optimism. Neither has anything to do with hope, okay? See, wishful thinking, you know, if someone says, I hope I win a lottery, you can't hope to win a lottery. You can wish to win a lottery. You see, when we define hope, you can't ever hope to win a lottery. You can wish it. It's wishful thinking, okay? And also, hope isn't necess is not identical with optimism. You can be an optimist with very little hope. You can be a pessimist and have a lot of hope. Because pessimism and optimism, those are temperaments, okay? Um, they're not hope. Now, let's define hope. Pierre Thierry de Chardin is a great figure of hope. One of the great people in the last century. One of the great figures of hope and faith and science, you know. But he was a Jesuit priest and a scientist. And he was, a, in fact, in his own life, he was temperamentally kind of a, not a very upbeat person, you know, more of a silent, reflective type. And one day he was giving a, a conference to some scientists, many of whom were atheists. And he was showing how he believed that the convergence of evolution and scripture it's going to come together. Evolution is going to lead us exactly where scripture puts us and so on, where the Ephesians hymn, where it's at the end, you know, it's all going to come together in Christ and so on. And he had this wonderful vision of the end of time. When he was finished, some scientists said, well, said, um, that's a very optimistic little schema. But he said, suppose we blow up the world with an atomic bomb. What happens then? Teilhard said, well, that would be a two million year setback. Okay. <laughs> no. That's hope. No, but just set it back two million years and it starts over and so on. He said, but it's going to happen. I said, he said, what I'm, I'm showing here today, it's going to happen. He said, not because I said it. He said, because God promised it. And in the resurrection of Christ, God shows that God has power to deliver on a promise. See, hope is based on a promise. It's not based on wishful thinking. It's not based on, well, I, I hope it turns out okay, or, you know, that's wishful thinking. It's based on a promise, you know. What, what's the promise? It delivered in the resurrection. I'll give you some examples. Okay. Uh, Archbishop Tutu. Okay. Um, our always tell this story, because they were quite involved, in Dennis Hurley and so on, with uh, the, the overthrowing of apartheid in Africa. But, you know, you're all familiar with Archbishop Tutu, and he was one of the, the great figures in on doing apartheid. He said, but at a certain point, they were, the soldiers would try to intimidate him. So he'd be preaching, and they'd come into church, and they'd just line the two sides with machine guns. So Tutu would smile at him and says, well, I'm glad you came to church. <laughs> he said, I'm glad you've come to join the winning side. He said, we've already won. And they laughed at him, but he was right. He wasn't just talking about apartheid. He said, we have already won. I'll give you the story from William Strunkfellow. And Jim Wallace tells this story. Wallace said when he was still a younger man, they went once to move some nuclear weapons or to block the movement of nuclear weapons in New Mexico. And he says, uh, so a bunch of protesters went out and they had heard where the train's going to be and they went out to, they were going to literally lie on the track and stop this movement. But two things happened. First of all, the government found out about it and rerouted the trains. So they were in the wrong place. <laughs> okay. And not only that, there was a big snowstorm <clears throat> that night, he said, and we weren't dressed for it, and we had hypothermia, so we're out there uselessly, and we're, that's, he said, so we got back to a church basement, he said, where we're drinking coffee and, 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 and miserably commiserating with each other, you know, how awful this had gone, wrong place, wrong clothing, nothing happened. He said, when William Stringfellow, a great Protestant scripture scholar, walked in, and um, said, Stringfellow was already dying of cancer. And Stringfellow said, you know, I'm old enough that I can scold you people. He said, uh, you're depressed and upset because your little project failed. He said, but let me tell you something. You don't have to save the world. He said, the world is already saved. That's the resurrection of Christ. We believe it's past tense. The world is already saved. It's saved. You only have to live in face of the fact that you believe it. You, know, you don't have to save the world. You sing these Easter hymns, you know. The strife is over. The battle's done. Let's talk about Jesus. The story, the, the ending of our story is already written. 
You know, the last guy you see there is a young oblate in Quebec City, Pierre Olivier Tremblay, who gave a powerful talk down here on our campus some years ago. And he said, um, he said, you know, he said, I'm chaplain, University of Laval, one of the biggest universities in, in Quebec. And he says, and I work with young people, French Canadians. He said, and these young people, they're full of life. He said, they're wonderful. He said, they're so full of life. He said, but you know something? He said, almost none of them have any hope. He said, they're living without hope. He said, because there's no meta narrative to their life. He says, they go up and down their energy with what's happening more immediately. Their relationship to their girlfriend, their boyfriend's good, their marks are good, their parents aren't breaking up, they're not sick, life is good, something happens, turns all of life upside down. Said, they don't have a, a, a big narrative, they don't have a meta narrative. See, hope is a meta narrative. When I was a kid, I was raised on the Baltimore Catechism. And some of you too. I remember we had to memorize it, and there were different versions. But it got to the point really quickly. So the first question was question answered, who made you? But now, the second question, why did God make you? You've got a meta-narrative. You know, I once saw an interview with Governor Jerry Brown of California, who was the next, he had been a Jesuit seminarian for a little bit. And this, this, this uh, woman says to me, well, Governor Brown, he says, what, what, if you have this guy, what's the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? And Jerry Brown said, well, I think the meaning of life is to know, love, and serve God in this life and be happy with him in the next, you know? <laughs> so the woman said, no, like seriously. He said, no, I am serious. He said, I've read a lot of books. I've read a lot of philosophy. He said, I was taught that as a kid. He said, it still makes more sense than anything else I've ever read. See, he's got a meta-narrative. So, you know, pain happens in your life, and there are breaks up, and close, people close to you die, and you get sick, and so on, you know? But you're, you're, it's part of a bigger picture. You know, Hans Urs von Balthasar, the theologian, said, he made this wonderful kind of his language. He says, you can live two kinds of lives here. He said, you can, in your life, you can live, he said, an ego drama, or you can live a God drama. See, a, a God drama, it puts you into the big picture. So he said this way, imagine that your life is a five-act play, okay? There's five acts to it. But you've already seen the ending. At the end, you're going to be the heroine, and you're going to. So, so you can go through some rough chapters because you know the end's already written. But it's true for us. The ending is already written. Julian of Norwich. In the end, all will be well, and all will be well, and every manner of being will be well. You're, the, the ending of your story is written. It's a happy ending. We're already the winning side. You know. See, so you can have some rough chapters in between because you're part of a, a God drama. But if you're not that, von Walter says this, then you're living an ego drama. That's what Trombley's talking about. He says, then you go up and down, depending what's happening in your life, your state of health, your psyche at that given moment. You're, you're going through all the gyrations of your ego, you know. And uh, he said, these are wonderful young kids. And he said, they have all this life. He said, but they don't have any hope. He said, they don't have a meta narrative, you know. Um, Jim Wallace, who I think is the best the theoretician to have hope, Jim Wallace always says, said, don't base your hope on the news at night. Don't base your hope on CNN. Don't base your hope on Fox. Don't base, he said, base your hope on a promise. You know, he says, hope isn't based on, you don't, you don't look at the facts and then base your hope. He said, you look at the promise and you wait for the facts to change. Get this? See, you don't look at the facts and then say, well, I'm good or bad. You look at the promise and you wait for the facts and they'll change. Daniel Berrigan says, do prophetic acts, not because the outcome is assured, but because the integrity and the value of the acts speak loudly. You do them because they're good. 